All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for hopping on um, our stream this morning um, for top 10 most asked questions for QSIS. Uh, we are all confined to our quarantine spaces, so we are doing this call uh, remote. So if we su succumb to network issues, uh, we do apologize in advance. I know there's a lot of people trying to stream things on the morning time. Uh, everybody's switching to Zoom and Teams and Blue Jeans and all that good stuff. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just going to introduce everybody that's on the call this morning. Um, joining us today from QSC will be Trip Matthews. Uh, he's a systems application engineer with QSC. Um, and I actually couldn't find a good picture of Trip on the internet. He's done a really good job of masking his appearance. So I found a picture of him in his natural habitat, uh, which is usually standing in front of a rack of QSIS. So I believe this is Trip at a, a football stadium somewhere in the southeast with a massive QSIS deployment. So uh, that's where we can typically always find Trip helping people with QSIS. And then we also have Chris Adler, who's our business unit lead for the system specialist group with HWP. Um, also joining us is Ed Dreyer, uh, which is on the system specialist group with HWP. And then um, I'm Kevin Duthu. I'm the BU lead for the pro user group with HWP Co. And um, kind of run a mission control here from uh, a QSIS standpoint. So I'm going to hop over to Blue Jeans, and you'll be able to see all of our pretty faces here in a second. And uh, let's see, I'm going to change this right here to a gallery view so you can see everybody. And there we are. Good morning, y'all. How y'all doing? Good. How are you? Good morning. Doing pretty good. You know? How's it going? Just trying to stay six feet away from everybody. Um, Keeping, keeping the distance as much as we can. So thank you all for uh, hopping on this morning. Um, you know, with, with QSIS, we tend to get a lot of questions, and I was trying to think of a good way we could do a stream or a webinar session and kind of, a, kind of address the, the top 10 most asked QSIS questions. So we queried uh, most of our dealers, um, most all the dealers in the Southeast, excuse me, uh, and kind of put together a list of the most um, most requested QSIS questions. Now, uh, those of you who are watching, if we don't cover your question, feel free to type it in the chat on the right or the bottom, depending on how have you your YouTube um, uh, structured this morning. So we will be addressing those toward the end. So feel free to type away. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it this morning. Question one. What are the most important tasks to do when getting QSIS up and running? So I'm going to switch it back to Blue Jeans here. And then Trip, if you want to go ahead and take that question. Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'll try to take the screen over here first. Hopefully, everybody can see the, the QSIS software screen. And the first items that everybody needs to do with to understand with getting QSIS up and running is that we ship all of the boxes with the LAN A connector set to auto IP. So it'll get a linked local address, just like your laptop would if you were used to using a Wi-Fi connection or anything like that from your business. So your LAN A is your connection piece. And the one thing that we find a lot of people don't understand is that when you add hardware, which is over in the inventory section here, and I'm actually in emulation mode, so I'm gonna disconnect here real quick is that when you add the hardware, what be either your amplifiers, your peripheral devices, IO frames, touchscreens, items of those matter, video cameras and things, you need to give them a unique name. So you always have at least one core. The only way you can have dual cores is in a redundant mode. But as we clicked on the core here, over here on the right-hand side, we have the property section and we have the ability to click where the core's name is and give it unique names, something like core A, core B, main core, backup core, left core, right core, whatever that may be. And this naming scheme must match the hardware. So depending on how your files are being developed, whether you're doing the, the file work first, before the equipment's been deployed or received at your office, 
or whether you're doing the file to match the equipment names that have already been added by your rack builders or even possibly by you. These have to match exactly. Uh, case sensitivity does not matter, so lowercase, uppercase does not matter, but any kind of dash or letter would need to match exactly. And you would need to do this for all of your devices. So I have these devices that are named. And a, a quick trick is once you've got your laptop connected and software open, if you go up to the Tools menu and drop down through the menu to near the bottom where it says Show Configurator, you should get an image of all the devices on your network. Now, by default, the QSC name will be core dash some random characters that were generated as we flashed the, the original flash of the box. And same with the other, and I apologize for the, the dog barking in the back. Uh, sounds like hey man, it's all good. It's, it's live. <laughs> so by clicking on the core device, you have a way, especially in the later software now, to jump straight to the core to name that. But what you can do is one of two ways, either take the current name your core is and just hop right over. Say we're looking at this IO22. We can hop right over here to the properties and name it to match. You can do a copy and paste if you want. The, so that would be transferring the hardware name to the file name. The other way would be if you've already built your file, and then we would jump up to the core. I do have a little bit of a, a fun thing going on with my computer this morning, but this is what the this link would take you to. You're going to open up a browser. It would automatically open a browser and take you to the core manager page, as we have now. And we have a just an overall status page, but if we want to go to management and network, you can go here, and that will show us the cores here. That's its name, the IP addressing, and the editing button would allow you to go and rename the core to whatever you created in your file, add IP addressing accordingly, and those types of things. And when you're done, you would have a, a save option here to save them. So I'm going to hop back out of this page for now and back to the designer. You want to make sure that all of your devices are named. Uh, we do get a number of calls where they just brought the devices in with their default names like camera-1, camera-2, but from the factory, the camera name might be camera-ptz-12 by 72-any number of characters. And those are the default names that get flashed into them, but obviously not a name you want to use. And think about your naming schemes so that they can be you know, understandable down the road for you and or your service technicians behind you that need to work on the equipment. And I think that covers the, the part we were talking about as far as naming devices. That seems to be the, the one of the biggest things. If you can uh, you said, get all your devices named correctly, your deployment of your file should go seamlessly. Hey, Kevin, you want to move on to something else? Awesome, thanks. So yeah, the next question is what are the best practices for setting gain structure in QSIS? Uh, we get this one a lot, and this is a very important question because you always want to make sure you make sure your gain stages are set properly so everything sounds good. So if you could just kind of go over you know, how to get the initial gain structure set up and kind of what that looks like. Okay. So some of you have used some other platforms that have taught you a little different way of looking at it, but for QSIS, this is an input block for a core 110, some mic line input block. And I'm going to actually go live here and pull the file from my core that's running so we can see it working. And sorry, I thought I would have this ready, but we'll get something playing here so that we have some source. Hey, it's live. All things yeah. happen. We're doing the performance here, so there we go. Come on, hit play. You can have some signal now. Plane into the core. And we do. And so this is coming in as a line level source, but I wanted to explain what we're looking at here. Notice you have a little bit of meter movement. We are set to no preamp gain at all, which is basically the preamp, preamp sensitivity is told or showed here in these boxes as plus 21 dBU. The big thing to understand with this is that our meter scale is looking at dB full scale here, just to the left of the meters. And dB full scale is the actual 
transfer from analog to digital converters. And the way that works is that at basically plus four, you would have a clip happen. So you've overdriven the converter in the meter setup of DV full scale. So that said, we generally try to have 20 dB of headroom. So we would want to set these inputs to be running with some preamp gain right up to about the minus 20 range. Song's really low. There we go. See, we blew it up. Okay. So now we're sitting here running about minus 12 or so, which is a little hot. We want to back that down so that we're seeing right around the minus 20 range. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what that gives us is 20 dB of headroom before we hit clip, and it actually gives you that extra plus four so that you would not hit clip. Now, if we bring this up to somewhere near zero range, you'll notice you'll start tapping clip as everything goes over zero to the plus side of it. And as we all know that clipped sounds are not good. So that information is really bad because once it's clipped, it's in your digital domain and you cannot get rid of that. So we wanna make sure that you don't get those signals like that. So again, running about the minus 20 range of all input signals for QSIS is what we suggest giving you that 20 plus dB of headroom. Um, once it's converted, we then offer you another set of gain knobs here, and QSIS is 32-bit floating point processing, so gain can be added and subtracted accordingly. This is the digital domain gain. The thing we want to make sure you have is enough input level so that you're running at about minus 20 so that you have good signal when you're bringing microphones in or other devices, especially if you're doing conferencing. You want to have enough mic signal to compare to your reference signals. And if you just ran this down very low, you would have very low input signal. So you are digitizing more of the noise of the system instead of having good signal to noise ratio. So we always want to, just the rule of thumb is in QSIS, set your input meters so that they are running right at the minus 20 range for the most part. Um, if you know you have lots of dynamic range, you know, heavy hits on drums or something of that nature, you may want to bring it down just a little below that because you want to make sure you never get a clip. And we also offer you this nice little piece here where you can do a clip hold light, and this will make sure the light stays on if it ever clips so that you can find out did something actually cause the clipping sound. Moving past this, I'm just hitting the mixer here. And then this mixer, I'm basically got everything set to zero. So we're just doing a unity pass. We're not adding any extra gain. Let me get the output side open over here. And so now you may notice these meters here are your gain is set all the way up at zero. So we're adding no gain. We can take gain away. We're providing plus 21 dBU out. And if you notice, these meters are hovering really close to zero if we got the minus 20 correct. So you've got a proper transfer through the system. We do have clips that you can clip because this is, again, your analog signal before it goes I mean, this is your digital signal, and then it gets converted back to analog to drive your analog devices, speakers or whatnot, or amplifiers. And we want to make sure, again, see, look, this is running right around the minus 20 range. But if we start adding gain to it, we're going to start pushing this guy up towards that zero point. And I'm just you know, heavily pushing gain in. Well, it looks like the song went low again, so let me wait. It should be looping, so hopefully, there we go. So now we're pushing lots of signal. We've added roughly 10, 20 dB of signal, which should put us pretty close to the zero mark. And as we get up there, notice the clips start tapping. So once we hit anything just above zero, we're exactly at plus four, you will get clips. And you will hear those clips obviously on the way out also. So again, being very careful with how much gain you do add throughout, but you can add gain in places necessary to make up for limiters, compressors, things like that. But watch your output meters, watch your input meters. Again, on the, the digital side, we're coming here at minus 20, and we're coming in the analog side at minus 20. That gives us a nice gain structure through QSIS and should have your signal nice and clean to support any kind of 
a loud microphone announcement? Am I dropping a book near a microphone? Something like that. Okay, Kevin? <clears throat> yeah, let me add something. This is Chris. <clears throat> Sorry. It's, this is very important. I'm glad we went over this because there are so many points to adjust gain in QSIS. And Ed can attest to this as well. We get so many different support calls with people that set their mic line input gain and then they're adjusting the level all the way through the mixer to the line out and then by the time you get to the source where you need it to be your audio is all whacked and you can't really trace it back so it's a really good idea to make sure and document in your design if you are boosting or doing something with that in in your in your design to uh document that and let people know what you've done thanks chris but it is. It's definitely. Uh, if you start it with it bad, it's going to be bad all the time. So you got to really take a, you know some time to get the the signal in and out of the box properly. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Trip. Sure. Um, moving on. Next question is. This seems like a simple one, but I know it can be kind of convoluted. But how do you update firmware? I guess just kind of like a general like, what's the first step you should do? You know, should you save anything? Step two, you know, what's the, you know, how, how do we properly update firmware without losing anything? Okay, well, I'm not going to obviously push firmware here in, in the events of time so we can get through more <laughs> right, questions. Right. But the uh, best thing to do first is always save your files at your current version. Make a copy of them, maybe put that as part of the name as, you know, FW, firmware version, whatever. And each step as you firmware update, you should always save your files at that step. What that does is give you a, the ability to obviously go back if you do happen to run into a situation where an updated firmware changes something that you're not you know, happy with or whatever. And then uh, if your systems are small, we not really a big deal. You could just take your file, open it in the newest version of Designer, and when you go to deploy that file to your cores, it's going to stop you and say, you know, firmware core is on firmware version say 7.1.2, um, you know, you're on version this, do you want to update? By hitting that button, you are doing a firmware update. Um, so it asks you if you want to do that. One of the things we like to teach as far as firmware updates is, and this works really well, is you can take, first of all, just the core and or the status blocks of the objects in your file and just open a fresh file with just those blocks in it. So if you have a system with a core and a number of amps and I.O. frames and things, if you just were to take a file and just do the status blocks and no other build, because you've still got a save of your other file, and then open that with the newer designer and push that as a firmware update, you would be able to update the cores and the devices without all of the DSP structure around it. Uh, it generally goes through a lot quicker. Um, the way updating firmware works in QSIS is the designer carries your firmware. So each new version will have a new firmware right to it. When you push that file into the core, the core is the first, I, first object that updates. Once the core updates, it will then reach out to every peripheral it sees on the network as part of its file, and it will update it automatically. So you will see in the, the left-hand pane of your designer, devices are saying downloading firmware. They'll be in a blue color. And if you hover your mouse over them, it'll tell you what state they're at as far as whether they're writing firmware now or they're uh, rebooting or something of that nature. And we've just found that if your system is large, doing the status components really makes the firmware update go smoother and cleaner. And then come back and then just load your you know, running file at that new version. And it will compare firmwares and go right in, update, and everything will be ready to go. Um, so that's the way we kind of like to suggest doing it, especially if it's a larger file. If it's a you know relatively simple file, generally no problem at all firmware and up, firmware updating. And when I mean larger file, you know, like you saw that picture of me in front of that rack in front of the stadium, sometimes it's a little easier just to to get the devices up and then put all the DSP behind it. Um, but the system will work that way. Uh, we also try to suggest staying away from Wi-Fi firmware updating. Um, in the event of a firmware update, while your firmware is writing to the core, 
your, I mean, uh, when it's downloading firmware to the core and if you lose connection, no big deal. But when the core is writing firmware and if it loses connection to its peripheral devices, that uh, could be a bad thing. Uh, generally, if it doesn't get a chance to do a full write, it will just reload the older version that it was on and you'll be able to pick up where you were and try again. So Wi-Fi updates do work, but we, you know, try to tell you to just avoid using no Wi-Fi update for firmware. Okay. I agree with the no Wi-Fi. I'm always, if I can go cable, I go cable. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's a good practice on that. Uh, is it a must? Absolutely not. I've done systems with Wi-Fi and had no trouble at all. But just as a, you know, we're looking for best practices and rules of thumb, wire connections are the best. Awesome. All right. Without further ado, let's get on to question number four. Uh, this one comes up quite a bit. Um, and it, it's relating to VoIP and just how do you properly configure VoIP? Um, you know, choosing different codecs, provisioning the system, et cetera. We get this one a lot. So um, I'm going to switch back over to you and we can talk about VoIP. Okay. I'm pushing this file in. It looked like the, the core had an older file in it when I pulled from it. So I want to make sure it has all the pieces. And as soon as it goes in, some of you have saw how it, you know, checked the design, compared itself, and now put the new file in. I'm going to go up to my VoIP tab just as soon as it completes itself here. Yeah, your doc is sliding QSIS back and forth while it's doing those updates, so sorry for that little glitch there. Yeah. I'm sorry. It looks solid here, so I don't know. Again, welcome to the <laughs> the remote world of learning all the streaming, but I bet we'll all be experts very soon. Okay. Yeah. Doing the QSIS so dance we, over here. Yeah. Well, it should be uh, coming up now. And yeah, I'll looks go good ahead now. and move to the, the VoIP tab that I just put in here. And this is kind of a view of an older version of how you entered the, the cell phone information, but it was a good picture to it. And so, you know, obviously, first of all, you would need to have the objects in your file. And this is just a very basic connective pieces here. We've got our cell phone block, which... Again, through the inventory, you go to the streaming I.O., you would add our cell phone blocks. You come in here, they have a status and control, which will be your dialer and control for it. And you have your VoIP in and your VoIP out here on the left. And I just have those blocks here in the file. And so my VoIP in, which we all know is that as being the far end call audio, is coming in. And the VoIP out is the conference room mixed audio of microphones going to the foreign caller. And so once we have these blocks in and get them wired in, we can look at the registration because that's kind of what we're looking at here in this question is you're looking for a couple things here. You're looking for a unique name for your room or your phone. And it can be many different things here as on the right hand panel, it's just a phone number of the room. People know to call that room number. Or it could be some code, you know, 5001 or whatever may work for it as a unique name. These are what gets registered with your phone provider as the name. Caller ID, that's what QSIS is going to respond back to the call, saying, you know, this is the room you called, you know, you're on a call with, just like you used to your caller ID on your cell phones or your home phones. The proxy information, that is the either the IP address to the VoIP server, or as you can see on the right-hand block, possibly a URL or a network address out on the, the web somewhere to register to a cloud-based service. Some require a backup proxy, not, not often, but they do. And then various transports, we support UDP, TCP um, data for transport of audio. And then if your system, some do not require this next step, which is register with proxy. Some just take the registration directly and you'll just have a password to go. But if you need to register with proxy, you have to have an authentication ID. And here they gave the registration of this would be SAM SIP in his core 510i, or it could actually be the exact same number that was given to you as your username. And again, this is just a secondary registration. Call manager likes, you know, requests the proxy registration, but some of the cloud devices do not. 
There would be a unique password. This would be created by the phone or SIP provider to you, and you would put that in. And this is what the blocks look like. I have a document right over here I'm going to pop up real quick that QSC offers on our website that I suggest you download for every chance that you work with, uh, you know, registering a SIP. It's just the QSIS SIP integration worksheet. And if you provide this worksheet to the SIP program provider, it literally lets you get all the answers to fill in all these blocks. They ask you, you know, IP address on that mask that you need to be on the network for. Is there any DNS required? What transport are you going to use for the phone? Any special options here? You know, a proxy. Subscription numbers, digest and usernames. That would be the username, the password. Subscription number could be the phone number to the room. What codecs do they want to use here? They can check which ones are available or the one they use. And then DTMF pieces, you know, are they using the these standard DTMF pieces? And that DTMF is your, your tone when you're dialing so that you can understand the numbers going through the system. And does it require any of these other special pieces like STUN or SRTP? And the idea is that this gives you, the programmer, all the information you need to get the VoIP system up and running. And what we have now, since in the newer software, this is what it looks like. So we're going to hop back over to the core manager page. And we're going to scroll down to the main menus where we see the soft phone. I have the one soft phone in my file. So if I click and open it, you're going to see, let me scroll down a little bit, raise this up. A lot of those questions that that paper would offer for you. And then there is this edit key. So don't forget the edit key. Hit the edit key and it allows you to go in and check and uncheck the codecs that you want to use. What LAN you're actually using for VoIP. Um, generally the VoIP systems go on one of the AUX LANs or the secondary LANs of the core. We generally we reserve LAN A to be all of the QLAN and audio transport and connectivity between devices. Are you using standard SIP ports of 5060 or did they, did they give you a special port you need to use? You know, or do you need SRTP enabled? Are you using standard DTMF codes or do you need a different code for it? You know, all this information should come from that sheet for you to basically just fill in the blanks. What username they gave you, what caller ID you want to have for the room, in the transport protocol, proxy, if there's a backup proxy, and then do you register with proxy? If you hit yes, then you have the authentication ID and password again, like we talked about in the little blocks in the front. And with this information, you should register up. Don't forget to save. Again, that's very easy to sometimes update and just forget to hit save <laughs> and it'll save the information in. Um, a few things to look for, though, during the edit. If your system does not register for some reason, we offer you a great tool here. So we'll go back to the edit. There's a login tool here on the left, just sort of in the middle under your LAN, and it says enable logging. And when checked there, you actually get a secondary log written in the core that only involves the SIP logging information. You would be able to get to that log with the core's IP address forward slash sip.txt, so sip.txt, and it will open a browser and pull back a data window that shows you the communications happening, you know, did you initiate the call? Did they accept the call? Did the codex mismatch? I mean, it's almost a readable document of what happens. Uh, I would highly suggest that if you're having some trouble registering, make sure you get some SIP logs, make a few call attempts or register attempts. Our support team is going to want that information. This generally points to a lot of things. I will tell you that the phone providers can read this as if it's their normal work documents so they understand it they can see quickly did you type in the wrong proxy are you on the wrong ip address you know things like that so when, when you're done and you're all registered up make sure you come back and disable login because there's no need to just keep pouring that data in the core okay then again don't forget the saves yeah that's very so hopefully that always save yeah very important so hopefully that uh, will help understand what you need from this. But I again, the, the easiest piece is to download that document, which is the, the SIP worksheet. 
provide that to your provider, get the information from it, and then you just fill in the blanks for the most part. That's awesome. Very useful. Yeah, um, you can. Oh, go ahead, Chris. There's a, sorry, this is Chris, and Ed can chime in on this too. We've, from a support standpoint too, and I know Trip has handled this, these questions a lot. Um, there are so many different factors when it comes to VoIP and making sure that you have that good line of communication with that SIP provider or the on-site, because a lot of times these are in corporate environments and you're actually getting somebody from IT that's handling the SIP side of things. You want to make sure that they're included on all calls and all uh, interaction with this so that you can make sure that if there's a problem, you can probably track it down right then and there. And yeah, it's and, a, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. And that worksheet is such a huge tool to have. Um, I mean, all that information that these guys know um, that we may not know how to communicate as AV guys is on that sheet. And so just passing that sheet along and getting in front of the right people uh, in that corporate, uh, in that corporation is a huge time saver and problem solver. And I was just going to add that uh, the the SIP log is a must. Usually we answer most of your questions with the SIP log pretty quickly, especially showing that to the phone provider while you're working with them. Uh, we do offer another deeper option, which we can actually do packet capture and Wireshark captures within the core. Uh, our tier three support teams will help you with that uh, if you need to get to that far. And that can actually see if we are receiving and sending the proper packets to and from. But uh, that's... You know, generally that's a specialized case when you need to use that. The the SIP login usually will find most answers pretty quickly. Awesome. Wireshark for the win. I can't tell you how many problems I've solved with Wireshark. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a great tool to have. It, it, that's free, correct? Or I guess if you can use it in the core, it's redundant at that point. It's yeah, You would just download Wireshark, which is a, a free application, and then the cores actually have the built-in packet captures, which we could possibly talk about at another time, and or our Tier 3 support teams will easily show you how to use them. Um, and at that point, you're getting direct packet capture at the NIC, not asking IT to give you mirrored ports and all that stuff. So, again, we use that when we have to pretty much get to our Level 3 support where you're having a little bit deeper problem than the obvious tools help. Okay, awesome. Well, let's get back into it here. Uh, question five. Um, I keep getting the same warnings in QSIS Designer. What do they mean? And I assume they mean like there's there's some warnings that are, you know, less important than others and you can almost kind of ignore like either the fan warning or some other warnings. So can you touch base on um, what warnings you should pay attention to and which ones are less severe? Yeah, so sometimes, and there are a few things that are that are interesting with the warnings, but uh, under the design inspector here, and that's the very bottom of the left-hand section of the core, you, this is where you can see most of the DSP or functional warnings that are happening. Um, a lot of times what we find is there's a warning around a script that somebody has installed or possibly written their own. And the warning is telling you here the script is running, you know, some high level of memory usage or something and they should really much be running at zero percent usage because uh scripting is such a light language that's why it was embedded to do extra things but there's a chance that somebody is recording meter data you know three thousand times a second and then comparing it to something and it's just eating up a lot of space so those are warnings uh, a lot of warnings that people get also are the license warnings the core will warn you that you require a license to deploy a certain file, especially if you didn't have a, UC, a user interface license and you've built a user interface, it's going to warn you that you require that license. Now, the older cores, cores past uh, February of 2000, February of last year, I believe it was, they do not require the licenses, but the software still warns you. Um, so if you have older cores that are deployed roughly a year, year and a half old, you kind of get around some of those licenses because those projects were already installed and we didn't want to have to go back and have you charge your customer to you know, use things that were already working. So we made a point that when we went into licensing of these pieces, we kind of drew a line at a certain delivery date of the product. So you may get warnings about licenses, but the cores will deploy the files just fine. 
Um, so, you know, you'll know when it won't deploy because it'll go into, you know, deploying the file and then it'll come back and say, unable to deploy, license not here, you know, please install license. At that point, you would need to get the appropriate license needed for either scripting or for the UCI deployment. Um, one thing that we have seen that's interesting is, and you mentioned that, is that sometimes we'll get a, a fan warning that is actually pulled because where the fan wanted to write memory to say it was okay, there was a script or a plugin that was running inappropriately. Um, sometimes people are learning to write scripting. They make some mistakes. They create what we call memory leaks. Like I said earlier, you know, maybe recording meter data. 3,000 times a second when you don't really need to pull in that kind of information all the time or something of that nature or you know you got a plug in from somewhere off you know it's not part of the asset manager that was written by somebody and it may be causing some trouble and we have seen that the fan stoppage warning will throw itself because we believe it's a memory write location that the fans trying to write and it gives you that and it's not a requirement for the hardware to be replaced so we always suggest the first thing to do is look over here under inspector and see if any of these things are showing high levels of usage. Because I would pretty much bet if you had a fan fault problem and you delete one of those scripts and redeploy, it likely goes away. Um, the fans are very robust. They run for years and years and years. And we've just found that that's something that's happening in some weird, odd scripts. So the, the team has informed me to suggest everybody to, you know, if you see this warning, first thing to do is to look at your design inspector, see if any scripts are running high levels of usage. If one of them is, to possibly delete that one from your file, redeploy, and see if your fan stoppage goes away. Likely it will. And then you just need to dig into that scripting and see what's going on with that. Um, I don't know of any other basic warnings that aren't, you know, really telling you there's something wrong with the system. You know, obviously you get all sorts of, you know, Device is not here because I don't have the two cameras actually on my file, or I've got this set for, you know, not needed. Different things, devices offline. I mean, your window here in the inventory can give you a quick view of everything. The other piece that I highly suggest is while building any file, you build a status page and you put the core status information, you put the device information, and these are windows into those devices, you know, chassis temp, processor temps clock offsets, you know, fan speeds again. If you got a fan speed, but you got a fan stop warning, that pretty much can tell you right there the fan is running because it's metering how fast it's moving and things of that Trip, nature. you want to cover where you pull those out from? Sure. They are part of your inventory of each of your object. And so here you may see the core is missing its block. I just grabbed it here and brought it in. And same for the... IO-22, here's the status and control, and I just brought those blocks in. Yeah, that's important. To build the little LEDs page. sitting on top of them are just because I like to take the little informational LED right here, the overall status, and just pop it out on top so that you get a quick view of is the block okay kind of thing. Awesome. I think we did have one question that was just but, submitted to Ed. I'm going to let him uh, read that question. Yeah, Trip. so when you mentioned something about the licensing warnings, um, we had a question come in about licenses and when you need them and how to deploy them. Well, uh, with every core that has been since February of, I believe, last year, uh, you need a license key for any of the user interfaces. So if you're using our touchscreens, the uh, iPad apps, the UCI viewer, any of that, if you're creating a user interface that you're going to deploy into the core, that requires the user interface license. It is one license for the core, and you can run as many UCIs and touchscreens as your file and core will support. And it's per perpetual, so it stays with the box. There's no need to update it every year or anything like that. The scripting license allows you to use the internal scripting engine of the core. So we use any of these pop a new design open real quick. Any of the scripting pieces that you have over in your inventory, so whether you're using the block controller, as it boots up here. So any of the items under the scripting tab, whether it be the block controller, 
the control script or the text controller, which are the three versions of writing your own internal scripts, or using any of the plugins. So plugins do run Lua script in the background, so it does require the scripting engine to allow these to run. So that's where you need them. Um, and again, the scripting engine will allow you to run as many scripts as you want in a core. And it's perpetual with the core, but it's just a license that allows that engine to run with the core. Awesome. That um, just to clarify, because I get this question a lot, um, that does not include any of the control components, correct? So if you're using a command button to send a single string to a third-party device, you will not need the scripting license? That is correct, yeah. Any of these control objects that are here, these are all compiled objects, and the button the block that he's talking about is this command button block. And this block will allow you to do TCP or uh, get the property open, sorry. So TCP, UDP, or serial connections to the core, and allows you to put in strings and push the button. Now this block is a very simple block. It will do most of your control for you but it does not do any reporting or any parsing of return data. Uh, there's nowhere to monitor. It's not doing get statements or anything from the device you connect. It basically opens the socket, pushes the command, and drops the socket. Most of your return information is, did the lights turn on? Did the screen drop? Did the display change source? Those types of things. But this block is definitely not require a scripting license to use. That's awesome. You know. Great. All right, let's see what do we got next here. The next question. When will software based Dante for QSIS become available? Will be available? Well, as everyone knows, we had listed a, a date that we had to kind of, you know, put a little bit of pushback on just because of what's going on in the country, as we all know. Uh, we're still hoping to have it available in the next few weeks. Uh, please keep an eye on our website and uh, keep in touch with the HWP folks on that. As soon as we can get it, it will be coming out as part of our 8.3 release. Um, and like I said, as soon as we're able to get that going, we will. But uh, we're hoping in the next few weeks. Okay. And Great. I just want to make a note on that is that it only supports the core 110 as a beginning. Uh, we will add the other cores and support on that at a little later time. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, let's see, moving along here. Question number seven. What are the network requirements for QSIS? I guess we can get pretty granular with this really easy. So let's look from like a 30,000 foot view down to like a 15,000 foot swoop, just like general network requirements for QSIS. Okay, well, QSC has kind of taken a, a three tier stand on this, and I don't have really have images for it for right at the moment, but we'll just talk. Is the, the first tier is basically buying a pre-configured switch from us. And you've seen on our price sheet, we offer three models of a, a Dell enterprise grade switch. They come pre-programmed to run everything with Dante, QLAN, AS67, our cameras. Um, the smaller one obviously could support a video node or two inside of the switch itself. The larger ones have larger uplinks. But the idea behind that purpose was that's a single switch based system pre-configured uh, for someone who doesn't have the support team to do switch configurations. And they, oh, there we go, thanks. So this would be our, our switches we offer. And this whole idea is to put a switch in your hand off of the price sheet that's pre-configured and ready to go. And our team will offer support on this. Um, do you have the next tier or not? The next tier is basically having you guys uh, go up, go back one, go back, go back to there. Nope. Yeah, here we go. So the larger enterprise or deployment of networking would be from, you know, having a facility IT department put the programming needed in the switches. And this is where we require the QoS and its quality of service. And what that does is tell the switches to follow a decision mechanism of which packets are more important than the others. Um, this is not taking over the highest priority of the network in any way, but it does read a header on the switch on the packets and says, oh, the clock is high priority, put it in that queue. The audio is a, a medium priority, put it in this queue, and then meter data or control information is down in a lower queue. 
and it releases the packets in order so that you always get clock, audio, and control, and so that you can keep your audio in a very tight sync. And the QoS needs to be set up on these switches. Uh, when we get into video or multicast, uh, QSC does very little multicast on the audio side. Our clock and our discovery packets are the only thing that are multicast. And then you will get multicast with either our cameras or our network endpoints for video as you increase them over one or two devices. That's in where you need another protocol called IGMP snooping and a querying engine. They must be turned on. IGMP snooping is a protocol that would filter multicast out of ports that don't join a group. The querier is the uh, informational piece in the switch that asks each device, whether it be a laptop, a QSIS node, a you know, a printer, whatever, do you want to receive these multicast streams? If they say yes, they will get them. If they say no, it will block them. So that's a must when you're starting to do with multicast video movements around. And those of you that have done any of the other products out there, you've already kind of got yourself used to that. The switches must be a managed switch so that you can go in and program this stuff. Uh, QSC used to keep a nice list of this and do a lot of work to test switches. Switch manufacturers are popping new switches out about as fast as TVs now. And so we decided to kind of take a, a little different stance on this and we joined up. And if you can scroll back to the University of New Hampshire, Kevin. And there you go. And, it, and again, he's just on our website, so you can certainly get more deep information on this. We're doing kind of a broad brush on this. Um, but this is a new, the University of New Hampshire has an interoperability lab where they're teaching all of the college students networking. Uh, we went into a partnership here with them, and we can get systems tested um, as part of the agreement. So if you run across a design that has some new network switches that nobody's heard of and or you're not sure, we can use uh, this as a pathway to get the network certified or tested in the event it's something you know completely new or you know you're just not sure about uh, there are some fees involved obviously but uh, you would get your network fully certified and all set up for you that way and we're also having this lab do switch testing for us so we're keeping a, a list of the newer models and getting them run through as we can uh, to set up documents so there are setup documents for various switches that have come from this lab that are available on our website. Um, but the main things is it must be managed switches. There can be layer two or layer three, uh, but then we use layer three QoS and the IGMP snooping and querier engines must be in the switches to keep the multicast control as you get into either AS67 or the video transports. Uh, and if you need more information on that, please check our website. That's where Kevin is. I mean, all this information is well defined here. There's also a nice document we have, which is called the QLAN notes, that will tell the IT team exactly what QSIS requires. Uh, we don't have time to go through that whole document, but it literally tells, gives you ports that we put different protocols on, uh, everything you need, and it's written in IT form. So please just download that document and share it with your IT team, and that should give them every answer they need. Okay, awesome. awesome. And I'll, yeah, I'll also make sure uh, once this video is um, done and finished processing, uh, any of the links we discuss uh, during the live broadcast will be in the description at the bottom. So um, I'm making notes as we go and uh, I'll make sure all this is easily accessible for the people that, that watch this back. Um, all right, let's move on here. Um, question number eight. Um, we get this one a lot just kind of as an overview for the QSIS cameras, but um, what can I use the HDMI output on the QSIS camera for? I, I know that all the video goes through um, QLAN, uh, but there's also, you know, uh, I think there's like a SDI, HDSDI output on the back and HDMI as well. So if you could touch base on, you know, what those could be used for in addition in tandem with the QLAN video, I think that might clear up some some questions. Sure. Um, for those of you, did I get my screen up and you're seeing a picture of the back of the camera? We're good. Okay, good. So as Kevin mentioned, and I'll just start with that at the bottom, we do stream the camera video. And the whole idea was it was streamed to a USB bridging device to allow the video cameras in a meeting space or auditorium to hit a software protocol like BlueJeans, you know, 
any of those out there and we hit them with a, a USB connection from either the IO USB bridge or the core 110 as a USB B and it has two streaming protocols, a low res uncompressed and a higher res compressed and that the codecs will pick which one they want to use for that and allows the video to then be streamed to the world. Simultaneously, the HDMI and the HDSDI have 1080p video from the camera, which is live video from the camera. So these could be connected to, if you have an auditory system, an auditorium system or things where you're doing live video mixes, uh, you can use this as live video to either represent onto the screens or to build the recordings from or anything you want. It is continuously available as the streams are available at the same time. So you can have the best of both. You can have live mixes with the video and, again, the streaming parts as they go out to the various soft codecs that you're using. Uh, the HDMI is also a great tool for the first time use of the camera. If you just plug it to a display, the camera will boot up and show you the camera's information. In other words, the IP address the camera is on, the name it may have, especially if for some reason you're not finding it in the configurator because it's on some odd IP address or your laptop's on an odd IP address and the two are not finding each other, the HDMI out. And I'm sure the HDSDI has it too, but very easy to get an HDMI cable and plug into a video display. And it will give you the camera's video and then that, that information needed as far as IP address and all that. You can't do anything with it other than to view it. Um, but that's about the only thing the camera's going to give you without the, the QSIS core managing it. But at that point, at least you know where to put your laptop as far as IP addressing. And then the configurator will find it at that point and you can get it massaged back into your network. Awesome. And re also regarding the camera, I know this question always comes up when people look at the back of it, they see the, uh, the power input. Um, if you're using this with QLAN, it's all PoE. So, I Correct. mean, w would it be safe to say you could also use that DC power input as like a redundant failover supply? Um, or can you use uh, it? Absolutely. Or, or if okay. you didn't happen to have, you know, PoE based switches in your system and you wanted to add a camera, you could do the local power supply or you could do PoE injectors, of course. It was just the ability of some, you know, designers would like to have good fixed wall power to devices. They don't want the, the PoE. But uh, it runs on either one, standard PoE or the the 12 volt DC wall supply. Awesome! I know I'm I'm always about redundant redundancy, so uh, that's always good to have an option. Okay, great. Um, let's look at question number nine here. This relates to the asset manager. Um, how do I find and insert plugins um, within the asset manager? And um, and we're gonna. Yeah, so we're going to actually use uh, a couple computers here. I was having a little bit of network trouble this morning, but uh, while I'm on the screen before I switch it off to the other computer, this little puzzle piece right up here in the top, right across the main menu, is your access to it uh, when you're in compiled mode. And then uh, I think we're going to switch over to, I think it's Ed's display that will show you how to, we'll go through how to get to it. So if Ed wants to take over... Can you guys see my screen now? Yes, you're good. I see it, yes. Awesome. So, so I'm going to work with Ed here on this. Uh, he's also at the same little puzzle piece we were talking about. He is in an uncompiled state. So before he goes anywhere, I want him to move over to the right-hand side of the software. Over where he slides down under his components, and then he has a plug-in section there. And this is where your download is going to end up when you pull some down from the web. And I just wanted to note here that he's got a little green block behind it that's telling him that he went to the asset manager, the asset manager checked and compared the ones that he had downloaded and says that 15, 52 of them need updating. So QSIS Designer is trying to give you ideas in the asset manager of ones that we have had updates to. So there's a, one of those little puzzle pieces just to the right of where his cursor is. If he wants to go there or the upper one, either one works. If he clicks on it, you will need to have your designer, obviously, or your PC connected to the Internet properly. And this will come up. And what you have here is there's a browse capability there, which is kind of what mode he's in right now. There's a one to the right of that says installed units. So he's got 
a number of packages installed already. And these are the ones that are already on his device. And notice all the little green dots there are saying you could use some updates. Uh, we did a lot of updating around the, the QSIS uh, Reflect Manager or in Reflect and all that so that we made these all capable and ready for that package. And then there's the update tab that tells you how many need to be updated because there's multiple under certain names. So that's why he has more than 13. But in the Browse tab, that should, you know, with the scroll down bar there in that uh, sort of middle section, these are all the devices that are up from various manufacturers that we are managing as plugins. Um, so they have all the control code behind them. They've been compiled up as a plugin and all the graphics and different information is there. So anyone that they may want, he's hovering over, he can just kind of maybe hit the Roku one or something. Oh, we're on by it, so I don't know. But either way, notice that he's on the, the Shure Accent one because that was the last one he selected. It's in the version numbers there and just to the right, or the Roku's the same way. Uh, the version number, if he moves over to the right slightly, you notice the version number at the top, and then there's an install key right to the right of that. And he hits install, that will install the, the plugin into the, the folder that we keep them in, and it will show up under his asset manager. Um, and so whether he wants to download it now or not, it's up to him. But uh, This is a license we'll feature, by the way. It's very yes. important to point that out. In order to utilize this, this does require the scripting license. Yeah, and you know, but this gives you all these different control modules already done for you with nice GUIs inside and all that ready to go. Um, if Ed moves down through the Roku slightly, there's a summary tab. It says click here. Those are the places where you get information about the plugin, how it works, uh, how to use it, those types of things. The other option is using the bring the plugin block into your designer and use the uh, F1 key, which is takes us to our help file, and you should have the useful information there on how to use it. You know, you may download this Roku unit, but we don't know how it actually works. So there's a little document written in there that helps explain how it works. Um, but that's how you get to these. Uh, again, if you you can download them without the scripting license into your designer, and you can look at them. But if you go to deploy them in a core the core is going to want you to have the license to be able to use them. So just, you know, feel free to download as many as you would like and give them a look and see what you get from them, see if they can help you out. And if they can, they may save you a lot of work, obviously in the control side for using QSIS and our touchscreens or an iPad app or a ViewSide Viewer and another touch-based panel to allow you to already have control over various devices. And like I said, you can see there's quite a number of manufacturers that are working directly with us to start building all of these plugins so that we'll have them available for you. Uh, does that cover it? I think it's pretty easy to, to get yeah. to. Yeah, I think you got it. Yeah, I think so. And just notice again, I'll touch on the fact that if a manufacturer that wrote these for us or our team that wrote them has done an update, Again, you get that little block that tells you the, the the block has changed, in which case you can go update it, and it'll just you know write the new code in its place, and you'll have the updated code, whether it was features that changed or something within the device. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Trip. Um, and then sure. we have our our final question ten here. Um, come on, mouse. There we go. <laughs> Um, with the network video encoders, um, can the NV32Hs be deployed on a VLAN? I'm going to go on a whim here and say yes, but I didn't know if there was any complications or anything weird you had to set up in well, order to get that going. It really depends on how your VLANs are doing. If your VLANs are staying within your local switch, obviously not a lot to, to worry about on that, as long as your switch can support the, the backbone of having a gigabit per you know, encoder, decoder setup, because uh, we can stream up to a gigabit uh, of 4K, 44460, and obviously lower bandwidth if you go down into 1080p and some others. Uh, the thing about the VLAN is, yeah, you're just making a group of connectors that stay locked together on a, on a local switch. The thing to watch out for is if you are going to take your VLAN and share it through trunks across other switches, 
is that your uplinks and your connections between these switches are able to handle the bandwidth you're moving. Uh, a one gigabit uplink will not support four or five one gig video sources, obviously. So then you're gonna make sure you have a, a 10 gig uplink or larger between the switches so that you can join from one switch's you know, VLAN over to ports on the other switch that are a part of that VLAN. So those are the same, it's the same thing as everything else. It's just maintaining the fact that your infrastructure can support what you're trying to move across the network. And then we all know that video traffic, even though we've gotten our compression mechanism shift to keep you under a gigabit, um, you know, if you put a bunch of them together, you're still going to add up lots of traffic moving across that trunk. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure that you maintain your QoS throughout your whole network. So both VLANs have to support the same QoS and settings for your audio to keep things working. Uh, QSYS does not bring that video into the cores. That video stays on the network as either unicast or multicast streams, depending on how many boxes you have. And it just you know, allows you to go grab those requests for joining those multicast groups or those streams with IGMP snooping and a query running correctly. So the one thing that we know has to be enabled is what we call fast leave in your IGMP setup because you have to be able to leave one group and join another group quickly. If you don't enable that, you can have a small bit of you know video distortion or kind of a frozen image while the switch is negotiating that change. Um, but if you do fast leave, it's within the, the milliseconds and we don't notice it and you get a quick, smooth jump to another source kind of thing. So keep an eye on that. Make sure that you're engaging fast leave if you're doing NV pieces on VLANs or trying to jump VLANs between switches. Make sure you've got a large enough connection between them to support the fact that you may want any to any kind of setup. God, it's all good info. And I guess for those of you who haven't had a chance to use the codec yet, um, shift um, actually fluctuates in bandwidth. So if you're showing just a spreadsheet, something that doesn't move a whole lot, um, it's not going to eat up your total bandwidth. But if you know if you switch to a 1080p or 4K video, it'll actually inflate your bandwidth to be able to get that video over the pipe. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, um, the next time we do have a trade show, or maybe we can do you know a future webinar on um, the video codec. Um, you can kind of see how it works. And uh, I know at the past trade shows, they had a little touch screen set up with, you know, your current bandwidth and they would switch between a spreadsheet and like a 4K video. And you can actually see the, you know, the BP it's, um, the kilobits rising and uh, falling. So it was, it was really cool. Um, really, really cool. So, well, that wraps up the top 10 questions that we get from QSIS. Now I'm going to go ahead and switch this over and open it up. Um, you know, please use the YouTube chat window to ask, ask your question if we didn't cover it. I know we had a couple come in. Um, we're going to start kind of teetering through these now. Um, Chris, do you have the first question that came in? Yeah, I've got it here. Great question. Somebody asked, can you touch on the HDMI? Boy, I got a weird delay happening in my ear. Can you touch on the HDMI on the back of the Core 110? Are there any uses for it? Uh, I can touch on that. Uh, the HDMI connector on the core is part of the the motherboard that we use. The, the cores use uh, a server-style motherboard that has that connector. The connector is useful for our maintenance team to watch the bias boot up of the device. Uh, it is not designed to be a video endpoint or anything of that nature. It was really designed for diagnostic measurements if the core is not booting properly they can see where the boot faults are and things of that nature okay cool awesome thanks Trent. um yeah it looks like uh looks like that was our only other question we'll give it maybe another 30 seconds here um we sure hope everyone is a... staying well during this time i'm just gonna go ahead and say you know we're kind of in a fluid and evolving situation uh as a world so you know working remote has been um challenging for some you know for some of us that work from our home it's been uh a little more of the same except we're just not going anywhere a whole lot of places so you know as this continues to grow 
make sure you you know like and subscribe to our youtube channel uh make sure you check in with um QSC and all the other manufacturers we represent because they're they're opening up all of their online e-commerce learning uh, just to be able to you know let everybody kind of take deep dives while it's kind of slow uh, even while it's fast you know there's there's a there's a plethora of training options out there but we hope to bring a bunch to you guys live stream on YouTube you know no software required you just hop on YouTube and you start the stream and um, you can participate as Kevin, much as you I- want. Add something in there on just on that note. Uh, yeah, also, with the the more live product of the QSC market, uh, what we call our live side, which is you know the K series and the the music, as we call it, the play out loud, you know, live band kind of stuff. There's a whole group of artists that are doing little uh, sessions. Corn streams, I think they're called. Or streams, yeah. That's awesome. Corn yeah. streams. Corn streams. But I just want to touch on that too. If you just need to, you know, want to look through that pick up some artists maybe you've heard of or maybe you haven't, but there could be some, you know, up and coming folks that could be the next stars. You never know. Yeah. Uh, all that's posted on the main QSC Facebook page. And then we also have a, an image of all the, um, the artists that are playing and the dates and times, um, on the HWP, uh, Facebook page as well. Okay. Um, but if you follow QSC on Facebook, if you like and follow them, uh, you'll typically get a push notification when they go live. So it's been, it's been good for me just hanging out at the house, you know, on a Saturday, even just something to break up the monotony of the news. So, um, make sure you definitely, make sure you definitely like, and subscribe to that. Um, well, let's see, we've gone about an hour and seven minutes, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. I'm going to throw up a slide here just with some good information. Uh, this is the phone number for the QSC system support. Um, so make sure you jot this down. Uh, it'll be there. And then also link below. If you're not a member of the QSIS Facebook group, uh, I highly suggest you check it out. Um, it is linked below. At least I hope it's linked below. If it's not, I'm going to go back and check and make sure it is with all the other stuff we did. Um, so those are some really good resources to have, um, you know, while while you're learning this system. Uh, and with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you to the, the 50 or so people that, you know, gave us your time this morning and, um, and tuned in. And um, with that, I just want to say thank you, Tripp. Ed and Chris for joining me uh, on this call oh, and um, you know providing some great insight and value to all this and we are all um, easily reachable you know if you ever need um, anything QSIS related QSC related feel free to reach out to just info at hwpco.com if you're in the southeast um, Alabama Mississippi Tennessee Georgia, the Carolinas. And then uh, for anything else, um, just reach out to QSC, that phone number provided, and they'll make sure that um, you get taken care of. So uh, I think that does it. I think that's it. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Wash your hands. Yeah, Yeah, wash your hands. Yeah.